Okay. <laughs> Um, has been a wonderful addition to our fetal group and um, really has been a wealth of a lot of great information. So thanks for being part of our team. And um, I've asked him to talk a little bit about the fetal forebrain development. Uh, he really has a great um, grasp and is a wonderful teacher, a master teacher. So hopefully we will understand this almost as well as you at the end of this talk. Um, again, if there are any questions, uh, we do have time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers. Okay, thank you so much for having me. So, let's go here. Yeah. Uh, how do I advance? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I got it. Okay. So, again, talking about the fetal forebrain and its development, I have no disclosures. That slide got um, omitted. So my objectives would be to review normal embryologic development of the prosencephalon and commissures and use imaging mainly, pre- and postnatal imaging, to sort of uh, improve our understanding of forebrain malformations. Uh, and to, um, mainly I'll concentrate on the holoprosencephaly spectrum, but also uh, discuss some other um, diseases with forebrain uh, malformations, some other syndromes. You so, might be able to get yeah. rid of that recorder, just put the X. Exit. Yeah. Okay. So before I jump into some of the highlights of forebrain development, there are a few kind of things I'd like you to keep in mind. One is not all brain malformations are genetic. Uh, so any insult can cause a brain malformation, obviously depending on the severity, location, and especially timing of when that insult occurred. So um, ischemic, infectious, inflammatory, anoxic, you know, you name it, anything can cause a brain malformation. Um, contemporaneously developing structures are often affected together, although a single gene defect can actually affect um, structures developing at different time points if the protein product of that gene is multipurpose. Um, and then epigenetic factors also need to be considered um, when, we, when we think about uh, the genetics of, of, uh, and, and development of the forebrain. So one of the first major events that happens is gastrulation. That's when you go from a two um, you know, two-sided two disc to a three-sided disc, and uh, sh followed shortly thereafter by primary neurulation. So at 25 days of life or so, the uh, the neural tube is closed. Um, the anterior neural pore is closed, and right after that, you have your three brain vesicles, primary brain vesicles, the prosencephalon, mesencephalon, and rhombencephalon. If the neural tube fails to close, you get anencephaly. Uh, if the neural tube closes, but the prosencephalon doesn't develop, you get aprosencephaly. And if you have rudimentary development of the prosencephalon and no development of the secondary brain vesicles, you get atelencephaly. And so here's a case from uh, here, and um, you can see uh, these axial, coronal, and sagittal ultrasound images um, that there is a bony covering over the forebrain, uh, albeit very malformed and bizarre looking. Um, but um, the primitive forebrain is uh, not well differentiated or evaluated. You can see very uh, contiguous brain across from side to side. Uh, the fetal MRI, at similar cuts, um, again, shows um, very malformed uh, frontal uh, portions of the brain, uh, and you can see that the midbrain is partially developed, the tectal plate is thickened, but the rhombencephalon is normally developed at, uh, for a, a fetus of this age. Uh, the patient also had a mid, single midline eye, um, cyclopia. Moving on, um, as the uh, secondary vesicles develop, um, you get, you, get um, you know, recall the telencephalon and diencephalon from the prosencephalon. The mesencephalon sort of continues on and differentiates, and the rhombencephalon um, turns into the metencephalon and myelencephalon. Uh, I should note here that um, the hypothalamus is no longer considered part of the diencephalon as classically conceived, but is now grouped in with a telencephalon. And that sort of makes sense when we think about holoprosencephaly and the fact that in classical holoprosencephaly, hypothalamus is always involved, uh, where diencephal the diencephalon is you know, variably involved. So in talking about holoprosencephaly, this is you know, failed separation of the prosencephalon very early on, usually less than six weeks. Uh, the etiology is multifactorial, uh, can be genetic. There's about 13 genes that have been identified, uh, a variable and kind of poor genotype-phenotype correlation there. Um, and also environmental factors, especially di 
uh, di maternal diabetes, that gives you a 200-fold increase in risk, uh, and uh, alcohol as well. The severity does occur along a spectrum, and there are several different classification schemes. The most widely used is the DeMeyer classification, where we uh, talk about um, a low bar, semi low bar, and low bar uh, along a spectrum of, of greater to lesser severity. Um, this is far from perfect. Um, it's very rigid, and you know we should be thinking about this in terms of, of, of the spectrum, but it also does help us uh, in terms of classifying the degree of brain malformation um, and for counseling purposes. But we should remember that um, it doesn't accurately predict outcome, and it also doesn't account for other focal brain malformations. Again, I want to underscore this point that there is universal hypothalamic union in classical holoprosencephaly here. We can see on this image the arrow pointing to the unionized um, hypothalamus here and subcolossal gyral regions. Uh, so, and in fact, uh, there seems to be a gradient, a central peripheral gradient that emanates from this area. So uh, the basal forebrain in this area will be most likely to be involved. And as you move kind of dorsally, laterally, and posteriorly, there's less involvement in the brain depending on um, the insult. So the mechanism for holoprosencephaly uh, is there's, a, there's sort of a, a, an interplay counterbalance between ventralizing uh, molecules um, emanating from the precordal plate and dorsalizing molecules from the alar plate that modulate the regional identity of the neural tube along its axis. So um, you could think about the classical holoprosencephaly uh, in terms of insufficient ventral ventralization, and most of this is uh, from sonic hedgehog proteins or excessive dorsalization uh, from bone uh, morphogenic proteins, um, as opposed to the middle inner, inner hemispheric variant, or syntelencephaly, which I will discuss, seems to be the opposite scenario, where there is either uh, too much ventralization or insufficient dorsalization. So here's a 21-week gestation uh, uh, coronal ultrasound image, and you can see a midline cleft lip and palate. Also, the intercanthal uh, distances, uh, interocular distance is narrowed, and so we know that in most cases the face predicts the brain, so we want to turn our attention to the brain, and you can see midline contiguity of the frontal lobes, so we're dealing with a holoprosencephaly here. In the, in the axial plane, uh, you can see this very abnormal uh, forebrain with no distinction uh, between the frontal lobes whatsoever. There's no inner hemispheric fissure, a large dorsal cyst kind of resembles a pancake. In the coronal plane, the thalami are unionized. And here again in the sagittal plane, thalami are unionized, large dorsal cyst. And the nasal bone is hypoplastic. Fetal MR images, again, uh, show the same findings in better clarity. Um, very malformed frontal, frontal uh, forebrain, uh, incomplete separation here, unionized thalami, hypoplastic nasal bone uh, in this patient with a low, a low bar holoprosencephaly. Um, other key features here is, would be absence of the septum pellucidum, absence of the inner hemispheric fissure, and falks. And uh, because these, this, this occurs so early on, it develops before uh, midline meningeal development, so you typically don't have uh, meninges. Just, yeah. Sorry, that, uh, with that arrow on the left, that, that hypo intense sort of curved signal, what is that? Um, so there are probably just more dens densely packed neurons here along the surface of uh, the diencephalon that just haven't migrated. Yes, you said there's no meninges. So the midline meninges have yet to form. Oh, okay. Yeah, the but the, 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 uh, yeah, the, the, so I misspoke there, but yeah, I mean actually you can see some um, tissue here. Some of this actually uh, may not be meningeal, but hard to say. But uh, for the most part, you can, can think about it, in, you know, with a lobar holoprosencephaly that the uh, midline falks and, uh, you know, inner hemispheric fissure are not present. It's one of the major distinguishing features. And uh, here's a postnatal CT, um, very characteristic appearance, uh, what we call an ant mini in radiology. So moving on, so the fissure actually develops at about five weeks and then the falks later on at about eight weeks. And so as the, the brain is developing a little bit further, you can have some degree of falks and fissure uh, formation in some of the more minor forms of, of holoprosencephaly. So in this 20-week uh, ultrasound, we can see in the axial plane, uh, hard to make much of the frontal lobes because of all the shading that's occurring from the, the frontal bones. 
but in the coronal plane, uh, we can see that the thalami are uh, opposed. Uh, we don't see the septum pellucidum. We don't see an inner hemispheric fissure or falx. Um, so this is in the spectrum of holoprosencephaly. Um, but as we move posteriorly in the parietal regions, there is an inner hemispheric fissure. So this cannot be uh, a lobar holoprosencephaly. It's one of the more milder forms. On the MRI images, you can see that the frontal lobes are contiguous. Uh, we don't see normal corpus callosum here at midline. The thalami and hypothalami are unionized. But post posteriorly, we do see this low signal band representing the corpus callosum that's present. Also, uh, part of the inner hemispheric fissure is present posteriorly. And here is uh, Falks more posteriorly. So this is a semilobar holoprosencephaly. And here's a, a case of semilobar holoprosencephaly postnatally. Um, Falks present posteriorly. Frontal brain uh, is not separated appropriately. Note the unionized hypothalamus here and subcolossal regions. Here's a 21-week uh, ultrasound, normal face. And apart from some mild ventricular megaly, um, there was, it was difficult to really uh, find another problem with the ultrasound. We can see the inner hemispheric fissure is present, the Fox is present um, in the axial plane. But in the coronal plane, um, we, we do see contiguous tissue across midline in the frontal region. It's not projecting very well. But we expect to see echogenic tissue here representing the corpus callosum, not hypoechogenic or dark um, appearance. So that suggests that there's um, failed separation of the frontal lobes. Uh, but the frontal horns are present, so that would be inconsistent with lobar, or sorry, a lobar holoprosencephaly, inconsistent with semilobar holoprosencephaly. Uh, when you have frontal horn development, we may be in the uh, lobar holoprosencephaly uh, category. So on the axial and coronal fetal MRI, we can see that the ventricles are large. Um, here again, uh, the falx is present posteriorly, but absent anteriorly. Um, but there is contiguous tissue across midline, so failed separation of the frontal lobes, failed development of the anterior corpus callosum, and unionized thalami. So, um, and again, the corpus callosum is present and normal here posteriorly. So this is a case of lobar holoprosencephaly. And here's a patient with lobar holoprosencephaly postnatally, axial, coronal, and sagittal MR images. Um, the falx is present posteriorly. The septum pellucidum is absent but the frontal horns are present. Um, note the dysgenesis of the corpus callosum. We have um, some components are present, and we don't see a good rostrum. Uh, what is present is, is quite thickened. But in general, if you have frontal horns and at least part of the body of the corpus callosum present in the, in the holoprosencephalies, you can categorize this as lobar holoprosencephaly. Um, the corpus callosum is a nice reflection of the development of the brain. Um, so in general, the more anterior the corpus callosum is developed, the better the brain is developed. And you can see the patient had normal olfactory uh, bulbs and tracts, uh, but the, uh, the um, frontal lobes are um, interdigitating across midline, so the, the anterior falx was actually a hypoplastic. Oh, yes, and the azagos anterior cerebral artery, which can be seen in any form of holoprosencephaly single anterior cerebral artery. Contrast that to the, uh, to the syntelencephaly, the middle inner hemispheric variant, uh, where on this um, ultra, axial ultrasound image through the lower forebrain, I assume we accept, accept this. Uh, not allowing me to do that. <laughs> Sorry for the delay. Okay. Um, if you ignore something long enough, it goes away. Um, so anyway, so this ultrasound image through the basal forebrain, we can see that the yellow arrows are showing sep clear separation of the hypothalamus. So here's the midbrain. Um, this would be the level of the hypothalamus. So this um, would essentially exclude the classical holoprosencephalies. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, so moving on, um, the ventricles uh, are enlarged here, and on the MRI, uh, we can see that the frontal lobes are contiguous. So we have failed separation of the frontal lobes. Uh, frontal horns are present. Um, again, the yellow arrows show hypothalami are separated, um, and we do have formation of the frontal horns of the ventricles. Uh, the corpus callosum posteriorly is present, so in the, in the area of the splenium, and here in the sagittal plane, we can see uh, parts of the splenium, but very peculiar that um, the, much of the uh, rest of the corpus callosum is absent, um, apart from the anterior most part of the corpus callosum here. So there's, there's a gap um, between commissural tissue. So that's characteristic of a syntelencephaly. Here's um, a better depiction of syntelencephaly postnatally, where you see normal splenium, um, some normal body and although, you know, blunted rostrum, uh, but a deficient colossal tissue here at midline, um, consistent with the syntelencephaly variant of holoprosencephaly. Uh, this patient also has absence of the septum pellucinum. Note again, the hypothalami are separated. Um, so going back to, again to the embryology, it's felt that this may be, um, you know, excessive ventralization or insufficient dorsalization as opposed to um, the classical holoprosencephaly, which uh, consistently involved the hypothalami and basal forebrain. So for diagnosis, counseling, and treatment, um, you know, again, multifactorial. Uh, if it's felt that chromosomal abnormalities may be possible, um, then, you know, you should consider karyotype, microarray. Um, some of these are autosomal dominant, so there's implications there for genetic testing and counseling. Family members need to be evaluated carefully for hypotelorism, uh, depressed nasal bridge, single maxillary incisor, cleft lip palate. Um, a single gene test could be done if, um, you know, family history is suggested. Sonic hedgehog is the most common um, variant to cause uh, an autosomal dominant holoprosencephaly. Treatment is multidisciplinary with surgery for cleft lip and palate and hormone replacement therapy, depending on the endocrinopathy. So there are these attenuated forms of holoprosencephaly, um, cleft lip palate, arinencephaly, central mega incisor, and interhypothalamic adhesion that I will touch on uh, briefly here. Uh, here's a patient with arinencephaly. Um, we don't see the olfactory bulbs and tracts here uh, underneath the cribriform plate. Don't see normal olfactory sulci. So these uh, olfactory, um, that the olfactory apparatus never developed. Um, what should it look like? Here's a normal patient at 21 months where you can see the olfactory bulbs here and you can also see the olfactory sulci above separating the gyri recti from the medial orbital gyri. We can actually see the olfactory uh, bulbs and tracts in fetal MRI, and consistently, if we have a good quality fetal MR at 30 weeks and beyond, um, so here's a 32-week, and we can see these hypo-intensities. Here, the red arrows represents the olfactory tracts and bulbs. Here's a patient with central mega incisor. Um, you can see a sing single midline um, incisor, should have two. Uh, the maxilla overall was underdeveloped here, and in fact, um, patient had piriform aperture stenosis. You can see narrowing here. The olfactory bulbs were hypoplastic, smaller than typical, and they had other midline anomalies, including the, that the corpus callosum is slightly thickened, uh, the vermis is underdeveloped, the nodulus here, and ectopia of the posterior pituitary gland, which should be sit sitting here in the cella rather than on top of the adenohypophysis. Interhypothalamic adhesions, uh, this is a disease entity that I first described in 2013 in a case report and then Dr. Vizina and I wrote up a case series last year. This is, a, in, this is a parenchymal band that connects the hypothalami across midline. How is this different from a hypothalamic hamartoma? Well, uh, it's horizontally oriented. It connects the hypothalami rather than um, emanating from one hypothalamus and it spares the mammillary bodies and ventricular floor. So those, those, for those reasons, this is really a separate entity. Um, so I, I question whether this could be a, a form first holoprosencephaly uh, because of the fact that in the classical holoprosencephalies, the hypothalami are not separated. Um, although the septum pellucidum is typically present in this disorder, um, but um, they do typically have other midline anomalies, so I think at the very least it's a red flag to look closely at the midline. Um, this was the index case where you can see um, three plane uh, T1 and T2 weighted images. This 
horizontally oriented band. It follows gray matter signal, no enhancement um, here, connecting the hypothalamite to one another. This patient also had other minor anomalies, including hypoplasia of the olfactory bulbs, the fox was hypoplastic, and the uh, hippocampi were under-rotated. Those should be, um, you know, horizontal in the, in the coronal plane. Here's a case I saw recently of a patient with interhypothalamic adhesion and a hypothalamic hamartoma. And this is the normal mammillary body. Anteriorly, um, this should not be present. This is a, a nodule of tissue representing the hypothalamic hamartoma. Um, and then here, in the, crossing the third ventricle, the interhypothalamic adhesion. And here's a fetal case uh, that I saw of, the patient, of a patient with agenesis of the corpus callosum. You can see copalcephaly here, typical appearance of agenesis, uh, radiating gyri to midline. Um, and on closer inspection, there's also midline tissue crossing the third ventricle, better seen on the postnatal MRI as this tissue here. Note how it spares the third ventricular floor. So this is an interhypothalamic adhesion in a patient with colossal agenesis. OK, let's shift gears just for a minute and talk about commissuration. So the great brain commissures are uh, axonal tracts that connect opposite sides of the brain in a homotopic fashion. Um, there are three main commissures. The anterior commissure, what is homotopic? meaning bilateral symmetric, one. Uh, sister structure connects the other opposite side um, equally. So, um, you know, a, the frontal lobe, a, a specific area in the frontal lobe would connect the specific area in the contralateral frontal lobe. Um, so, okay, so the anterior commissure is the first commissure to, to develop. It comes in at about eight weeks, followed by the hippocampal commissure at about 10 to 11 weeks, and the corpus callosum at about 11 to 12 weeks. The anterior commissure is interesting because it contains two different subtypes of fibers. First, the paleocortical fibers from the entorhinal cortex. Also, neocortical fibers from uh, mainly the infralateral occipital temporal regions. The hippocampal commissure connects the hippocampi, uh, and it is considered archicortical. And the corpus callosum is off, uh, obviously neocortical. Um, then there's a period of corpus callosum growth up to about 24 weeks, and notice how that coincides and overlaps with a period of neuronal migration. So it's, it's very common to get um, concurrent corpus callosum dysgenesis and neuro, uh, neuronal migration disorders. Um, also notice how that the, notice that the, the commissures develop at different time points, also in different places in the brain, and that sort of helps explain um, some of the different peculiarities we see with corpus callosum dysgenesis. Let's look at this for a second in diagrammatic form. Imagine that this is the uh, rostral forebrain, in the blue. The yellow is the primitive um, commissure, the lamina reunions. So at about eight weeks, the first commissure uh, to, to start to develop is the anterior commissure in the ventral lamina reunions via uh, axonal tunnels. Then at about 10 to 11 weeks, the hippocampal commissure comes in in the dorsal lamina reunion, so in a different location at a different time point. And then at about 11 to 12 weeks, we have the first crossing fibers of the corpus callosum uh, at the corticoseptal boundary. Um, and notice that the anterior corpus callosum forms in relationship to the septum pellucidum. And so that's um, why it's always nice to look at the septum pellucidum, look for the cavum septum pellucidum. Uh, when you're looking at fetal MRI and ultrasound, it's a nice sign that likely the anterior corpus callosum developed Normally, also notice that all of the anterior corpus callosum, including the rostrum, genu, body, and isthmus, develop before the splenium. So, on the next slide, I will show um, splenium fibers now crossing by fasciculation over uh, the, the hippocampal commissure. Also, notice uh, this picture reminds reminds me a lot of syntelencephaly. So, it sort of helps to explain why syntelencephaly. You have an intact anterior uh, corpus callosum, intact splenium, but a gap in between. So as the corpus callosum gro grows, the anterior corpus callosum, it will connect with the splenium and push it back um, to its, its, its normal location. So in fetal MRI, very early, the corpus callosum is short, and it's still growing. And you can see that components of the corpus callosum are present throughout, but the splenium typically um, in, in the mature splenium would overlie the mid-tectal plate. We can see it looks a little shortened, but that's normal at 19 weeks because it's still growing 
you know, to 23, 24 weeks. Um, the sept the cavum septum pellucidum is here, kind of hard to see the purple arrows here, and you can see colossal tissue crossing midline. At 24 weeks, uh, there's been interval, interval growth and to its normal position over the mid-tectal plate. And you end up with a situation like this with the rostrum, genu, body, isthmus, splenium. Uh, underneath the splenium, the hippocampal commissure. And again, the anterior corpus callosum forms with relation to the septum pellucidum. Here's a fascinating case I saw recently that I don't think has been described in the literature uh, of duplicated anterior commissure. Um, and this, I show this to sort of highlight the anatomy of the, uh, or the embryologic anatomy of the anterior commissure. As I mentioned, there are two sub-components sub of the anterior commissure. Uh, there's the paleocortical and the neocortical. So, and I think here we can see two separate and distinct um, nodular areas representing crossing fibers of the anterior corpus callosum and perhaps um, uh, different parts of, of, the, of the forebrain crossing in different areas. Here you can see in the coronal plane a very thin but present anterior commissure on this cut. Uh, and the other interesting thing was there was this uh, aberrant white matter um, the, coming from the temporal lobe. Probably this is the neocortical component that sort of just terminates out here in space. So there's aberrant uh, white matter tracks from the temporal lobe. Uh, and you can see this on the DTI image. You can see this, this linear signal here that's green on the color map, so it's running in the AP direction. Um, we don't see a corresponding structure on the contralateral side. All right, so in terms of corpus callosum malformation, it's a very common malformation, about 1.8 in 10,000. Uh, it's more common in prematurity and chromosomal abnormalities with advanced maternal age and with other CNS malformations. A third, uh, so fetal, in fetal brain malformations, about a third have corpus callosum dysgenesis. So you should really consider corpus callosum dysgenesis a symptom rather than a diagnosis and look for other things that might help find a unifying diagnosis there. Uh, most patients would have some um, abnormality, cognitive or motor delay, and incidental asymptomatic agenesis of the corpus callosum is very rare. Uh, so again, most have some it, from- Even if isolated? Even if isolated. It, it, you can have isolated asymptomatic agenesis of the corpus callosum, but many of these patients have subtle visual spatial disturbances, learning disabilities that may not be you know, manifest early on, so they, they need to be probably analyzed closely. Um, if you look on OMIM, there's 187 syndromes associated with agenesis of the corpus callosum. So again, think about this in terms of a symptom rather than a diagnosis. Um, so here's a 25-week ultrasound, uh, axial ultrasound, and we can see that the ventricle is enlarged. I uh, can't remember what the measurement was here, but it, there was ventricular megaly. Beyond that, the shape is odd. So there's more dilation posteriorly than anteriorly. So this is copalcephaly. And this is better seen on the um, fetal MRI. So you can see a copalcephalic parallel configuration of the ventricles. We don't see colossal tissue crossing midline. We can see probes bundles here um, stuck in the septum pellucidum and uh, radiating kind of gyri sulci to, mid sulci to midline without um, the, the obvious cingulum at the midline. Note that the anterior commissure is present. So this, this is a, a case of a genesis of the corpus callosum. The patient also had a uh, brain malformation. Here's a case of hypogenesis, dysgenesis of the corpus callosum, where at first glance the corpus callosum looks very thin. So this could be um, from you know, an insult to the brain and volume loss. However, um, the structure is also abnormal. Um, it looks very shortened. We don't see a normal rostrum. Uh, and uh, you know, again, the length is not uh, normal. Uh, here's the anterior commissure and the fornix you can see just behind it. So there's not a great separation between the fornix and the anterior corpus callosum, suggesting that the septum pellucidum was probably also hypoplastic. In the coronal plane, uh, we can see that the, the commissural tissue that's present here does extend all the way um, to the probes bundles. So some of this has to be corpus callosum. It's also connecting the fornices. Um, indicating that some might also be hippocampal commissure. Uh, here in the axial plane, we can see the probes bundles here along the medial margins of the ventricles. What about this case? Is this a hypogenetic corpus callosum? I don't see the anterior commissure, so that's clearly absent. 
Um, you know, but what is this tissue? The only way to really sort that out is to look in the coronal plane. And when we do, we can see that this commissural tissue connects the fornices rather than um, the rest of the brain. So this is actually not a hypogenetic corpus callosum. This is actually the hippocampal commissure, which is malpositioned. So this is a hippocampal commissure is present, corpus callosum and anterior commissures are absent. Why is it in the wrong position? Well, because the anterior corpus callosum never developed, it didn't have the opportunity to push the, the hippocampal commissure back to its normal location above the midtectal plate. And remember, uh, the lamina reunions embryologically sits anteriorly. Uh, the hippocampal commissure develops in the dorsal lamina reunions. I, I must mention one syndrome associated with, with a, or corpus callosum dysgenesis, the Acardi syndrome. Um, so if, we see, if you see a patient with corpus callosum dysgenesis and multiple cysts, you should think about the Acardi syndrome, uh, especially if they're female. And uh, so here we have a, uh, a peripineal uh, extraaxial cystic lesion, bilateral CP angle, arachnoid cysts, and the patient also had uh, subepinimal nodular heterotopia. So the cysts are extra axial. They're extra axial, um, although they can sometimes, I've seen them sort of infiltrate into the brain and be somewhat difficult to distinguish, distinguish but they're always centered extra axial. So they're thought to be meningeal tissue. Meningeal tissue, arachnoid cysts, they can have varying types of cysts, yes. And so this is the Acardi syndrome, it's um, X chromosome mutation, so it's exclusively females unless, you know, the patient has Klinefelters. And, um, they have clinically uh, infantile spasms, uh, abnormal EEG, colossal dysgenesis, and I highlighted chorioretinal lacunae, which is the hallmark of the disease. So these patients should be, if there's a suspicion of this, referred to ophthalmology to look for these uh, classic chorioretinal lacunae or lakes uh, in the retina that um, are diagnostic. Okay, and just to kind of finish this up, um, the, col the uh, colossal sulcus and sylvia and cell side develop at about 15 weeks, and then you have secondary and tertiary cell side that continue on uh, through the third trimester. So just a few syndromes here that have uh, frontal brain involvement. Um, the first uh, we sort of touched on, you know, earlier, this is the uh, possibly uh, septoptic dysplasia in this patient at 24 weeks. I can't really make that diagnosis in fetal life. Again, you know, you need, um, at least two out of the three parts of the triad uh, to make the diagnosis, that is optic hypoplasia, septopt or septum uh, hypoplasia or absence and, um, you know, abnormality along the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Um, here, the hypothalamus looks normal, uh, the corpus callosum looks normal, but the septum pellucidum is absent. So this patient would need to be um, looked at closely. Uh, here's a patient with septooptic dysplasia postnatal. The septum is absent. Optic nerves are very small, hypoplastic. Um, the posterior pituitary gland is ectopic, sitting here in the median eminence. The adenohypophysis is hypoplastic. And uh, there's perisylvian polymicrogyria. So again, this is loosely defined by optic nerve hypoplasia, pituitary hypoplasia, anterior midline anomalies. And, you know, two-thirds have hypothalamic uh, pituitary axis dysfunction. Some endocrinologists consider this necessary for the diagnosis. The pituitary dysfunction uh, is associated with a degree of septal abscess, and seems to, it seems to also be associated with prognosis. So if, if the pituitary is spared, the prognosis is better. HESX-1 uh, defect is common here, um, which is associated with other midline anomalies. It's also expressed in Rathke's tissue. Here's a patient with smith limley opitz syndrome, uh, seven dehydrocholesterol reductase deficiency. Turns out that cholesterol is necessary for normal precordal mesoderm signaling. And so if you don't have that, sonic hedgehog doesn't work appropriately, you don't get midline, uh, normal midline formation. So these patients can have varying degrees of holoprosencephaly, corpus callosum dysgenesis, and other midline anomalies. Uh, in this patient, you can see the corpus callosum is dysgenetic. There's a pericolosal lipoma. The fornices are splayed and thickened, and there's a persistent cavum septum pellucidum vergae. Here's a, here's a patient with pituitary duplication syndrome, very rare. Uh, I've, on I've only seen one case. This is actually from the literature. Um, if you give contrast here, it's actually very helpful. We can see um, that there are two pituitary stalks. So that's, that's pretty much diagnostic at that point. But often we don't have post-contrast images, and you have to look for these small um, 
you know, areas of, of tissue that are separated uh, in the cella. And the other peculiar thing is this appearance of the third ventricular floor heading back to the midbrain. I was looking at this and trying to decide, what does that remind me of? And then all of a sudden I was like, ah, okay. just like a mouse. <laughs> but they all have that. It's interesting. All right, here's a recent case we saw, um, sagittal ultrasound image. We can see there's a mass in the lower third ventricle. Where is that coming from? Uh, the sagittal MR image shows that it's actually coming from the hypothalamus. The hypothalamic mass lesion, this followed gray matter signal, did not enhance. So this is a hypothalamic hamartoma. Um, that can occur in isolation. It can also be part of syndromes, and we, so we need to look further. You can see that they, the neurohypothesis is ectopic here, sitting in the lower part of the stalk. Patient has coanal atresia. You can see an air fluid level in the nasal cavity, syndactyly, and anal atresia. So this is the Pallister-Hall syndrome. Here's a patient with CHART syndrome. To remind you, that stands for coloboma, heart defect, atresia, that's coenal atresia, uh, retardation, genitourinary abnormalities, and ear abnormalities. Uh, and this is a classic coloboma. We see microphthalmia. The left globe is smaller than the right, and there's this outpouching here posteriorly. The olfactory bulbs and tracts were also absent, which is very characteristic, actually, of charge um, in about a third of patients. There is unilateral coenal atresia. The semicircular canals are underdeveloped. And there's cochlear aperture stenosis on one side and cerebellar dysplasia. So this patient had all the features of charge syndrome. Um, and depending, no matter which cri diagnostic criteria you use, they meet all major criteria. So just on imaging alone, we can diagnose this, and that makes me feel good if I can diagnose it on imaging. Uh, this is a patient with Kalman syndrome that presented with hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism and anosmia. Uh, on the midline sagittal image, we can see a thickened corpus callosum. The vermis is underdeveloped. Also, the uh, uh, pituitary gland is very small. The hypothalamus uh, also uh, failed to separate appropriately. And there's the pituitary gland and the olfactory bulbs and tracts were hypoplastic. So this is Coleman syndrome. And here's a case of a 19-week fetus, and the patient had corpus callosum dysgenesis. We don't see tissue across midline here. But also uh, note in the hypothalamic region, we don't really see um, separation of the hypothalamus as we should. Uh, other findings uh, were thickened, horizontally oriented, superior cerebellar peduncle, renal dysplasia, uh, and this peculiar appearance of the midbrain, the molar tooth malformation. So this uh, would be consistent with the Joubert syndrome and with the hypothalamic hamartoma, specifically orofacial digital syndrome type 6. Here's a patient with Joubert syndrome. We can see under development of the vermis. Note the thinning of the lower midbrain here and thickened horizontally oriented superior cerebellar peduncle opposed cerebellar hemispheres rather than splayed, as in the Dandy Walker malformation, and the classic molar tooth malformation that's diagnostic of this disorder. So I don't have a conclusion slide that got left out, but in conclusion, there are many different, you know, things that can affect the forebrain, embryology, if we understand that, that helps us understand some of the malformations that can occur. And thank you for your kind attention. Fabulous. I have to carry it to go over all that stuff. Yeah, I, I don't know if anyone is um, listening up there, but if there, anyone has a question, they can um, just unmute and ask away. Otherwise, is there anyone else here that has a question? Like I said, I do have a question. Are you asking how many phases of isolation of the hypothalamus to decrease anatomy confirm that? Um, not 100 percent. You know, I, I think, um, y you know, it's really difficult to evaluate the anterior commissure and hippocampal commissure in fetal life, especially early on. And so um, I think that um, some, some of the ones we call, you know, agenesis, um, you know, or commissural agenesis, you know, can sometimes have varying degrees of connection between the hippocampi and between, you know, the anterior, along the anterior commissure. So that those need to be assessed kind of closely, um, and 
you know, but otherwise, you know, I mean, I, I think, you know, we do a fairly good job of saying, you know, based on the structure of the brain, whether or not the, the corpus callosum is completely absent or partially absent. I think that one of the difficulties is, you know, dealing with, you know, is the commissure I'm looking at a partially dysgenetic corpus callosum or is that the hippocampal commissure? And that can be really tough. Again, you need a nice um, detailed coronal plane image to be able to see what the commissure is connecting. Is it the fornix or is it, the, you know, the frontal lobes? Is your question that, that they're normal or that it's agenesis no, versus dysplastic? I was dysplastic. thinking that how many uh, cases are, you know, things that are and I think that the I was wondering how many of them are really isolated. Oh, so there, are there other malformations that occur there? Um, yeah, I don't know what the number is there, but I assume that there, there are probably, you know, at least some that, you know, are not completely isolated. And I think, it, yeah, you know, we, yeah, yeah. And we, you know, we do okay. need to then go on, you know, on a really detailed search of the rest of the brain for any other um, malformations that can help um, identify a potential unifying diagnosis there, and it's not just, you know, isolated agenesis. Yeah. I don't know the number, sorry. Yeah, and I think um, certainly it's one of the highest misdiagnoses that you know, when they come to us, they come as ventricular megaly or, um, and they don't think it's agenesis, so we'll identify that. But I think, you know, certainly the earlier you do these studies, the uh, the more we have to counsel that we may be missing some cortical stages. That was outstanding. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much.